Thank you, John. Um, thanks for uh, providing me an opportunity to be a member of this exquisite panel. And uh, going back to yesterday evening, I recognize, I mean, even though being a German, uh, the boat trip certainly introduced uh, facets of Berlin that I hadn't known so far. So um, maybe that's uh, a slight encouragement for anyone who is uh, considering being a host for these conferences in the future. Um, I, I liked it a lot, so hopefully uh, you had uh, some fun in exploring Berlin uh, from a boat. Um, since the um, conference title speaks about shaping the future, I thought um, that as, as the initial part of my presentation, I, I quickly speak about um, the future uh, with regards to Deutsche Post DHL and, um, and the way we look at it from a, from a corporate perspective, actually Deutsche Post DHL. Um, and um, as you might have taken from, um, from the press, Frank Appel, our corporate CEO, recently communicated about our strategy 2020. Um, so basically the way that we think and consider of shaping our future going forward. And um, obviously that to an extent was expected from the market since uh, we have been communicating about strategy 2015. Uh, for, for quite some time, and, and, and secondly, we definitely felt the need to really take a, take a shot at, at how we see the future unfold. And basically, um, simplicity is, is one element that we think in a, in a more complex and dynamic environment will be key um, to, to be successful, and, 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 and this is basically what Frank would describe as our corporate strategy on one page. This is basically explaining our view in the future. It speaks about focus, connect, and grow. Very simple, I think you can keep that in mind. Um, I will spare you all the details, but on focus it basically says, uh, we've been enjoying a fairly positive development as a corporation over the years, uh, and, and we basically look at the logistics industry as being quite an attractive industry to be in, so uh, no reason to change the good things from the past and carry them into the future. And here the, the, the bottom line is, is really, um, we, we have to work on, on achieving industry leading margins in, in the way that we do business. And that's gonna be our, our key focus in, in, in the regard of, um, of that part of the strategy. When we speak about Connect, we basically recognize we are, we're a large corporation. We're roughly 480,000 people around the planet, um, the sixth largest employer worldwide. Um, so we want to be, be strengthening our capacities as acting as one global team. Um, we recognize that um, um, we are a quality service provider. Um, there's a clear uh, intention that we further strengthen that position. Um, we will uh, continue to, to uh, roll out our certification programs for everything that we do uh, in our organization. And then basically, I think we, uh, we have a very common understanding about how we deal with uh, commercial issues, but also with regards to our, what we call shared values, uh, our responsibility for the planet. So clearly connecting all our forces inside the corporation uh, to really strengthen our position as uh, the quality leader in terms of um, logistics and service excellence. And then a third pillar, very conscious, is uh, we recognize um, we want to do more in terms of growing our top line, uh, not only the, the margin side, but really uh, uh, growing in, in, in various ways. And what comes to mind is obviously when you look at um, all the industries that you're acting in, that obviously e-commerce is, is one of the key areas uh, in which growth will, will continue to, to be very, very attractive going forward. Um, we also recognize there's a few geographic areas that probably were under leveraging uh, at the moment as, as a corporation. And then obviously we see a few uh, opportunities from a content side, and I, I will not disclose uh, uh, more details here, um, that we need to tap into just to strengthen our market position in various uh, uh, segments of our service offerings. So what, what you can see is we want to expand into new business segments, and the idea here is to say we want to achieve sustainable above industry uh, market growth. Um, so that's a view from, from Corporate Strategy 2020. Um, just a, a, a quick glance as to the opportunity in e-commerce, and, and obviously no news to you on the left-hand side, but probably quite interesting to see that overall uh, the growth rate uh, uh, greatly varies between what we call developed or mature markets and what we consider to be emerging markets. And, and maybe these numbers are even conservative, but they just basically display that uh, there is different dynamics in growth with regards to e-commerce. And then uh, obviously you see mainland China. So uh, a plus 8% uh, CAGR for the next uh, uh, six, seven years seems to be interesting. And obviously no surprise on the challenge side. Uh, some other people have made a similar observation. Uh, but the, the nature of the competition will greatly change. Yeah, so, so we're not 
only looking at like-for-like -like competition, which uh, obviously we're all familiar with in the postal and logistics industry, but certainly we see uh, uh, new emerging competitors, especially on the on the merchant side, so the left-hand side of the um, uh, of the chart, and um, and certainly we will have to see as to how that plays out going forward. So opportunity and challenge um, always come together. Now. When we speak about um, how that impacts us as an organization and me personally in, in, in my new role and, and the new name, um, we also recognize that uh, if you want to deal with e-commerce uh, within a, a large corporation, we thought that uh, we should give it to, to one division rather than, than have every division basically figure it out. Yeah, so basically the, the corporate board decided that the mail division, the former mail division, uh, would take the mandate to develop our e-commerce opportunity in a global way. Yeah, and uh, that's, a, that's a pretty important step forward. And um, if you look at the division, then basically there are two key elements that constitute the division. And for sure, you know uh, um, Deutsche Post and the Deutsche Post services. Um, and you can basically see the, the key service features. And it has always been our ambition to remain the post for Germany. Yeah, we, we are a very important part of, of, of everyday's life. Um, similarly important to football, or maybe even more important to football. But um, um, this is basically our aspiration, and this is basically what drives us. Yeah? We, we, we know that 80 million people in Germany rely on our services on, on an everyday uh, um, uh, situation. Uh, we, we clearly um, commit ourselves to, to further develop and enhance our services around the different areas, from mail communication all the way down to the in and out of Germany trade links. Now, at the same time, uh, we've also been carrying the, the DHL brand in our division for quite some time, and you know that from our DHL uh, packet offerings in Germany as much as you know it from the DHL Global Mail uh, offerings. And um, basically, those are the, the two key pillars um, that we basically created to, to create the subdivision, what is called e-commerce and parcel. And uh, it basically says that uh, we want to become the global e-commerce enabler uh, because we recognize, I mean, a lot of the e-commerce development doesn't fall from the sky. Yeah? And it's not that Amazon and eBay and Rakuten and Alibaba are the guys to drive it, but an essential portion of that value proposition comes actually from us, from Postland Logistics operators. Yeah? I mean, it's very easy for you to understand I can, I can buy something online, but unless you have that infrastructure, yeah, it doesn't create any value because nobody is there to ship it actually to your home or somewhere else. And... Um, Within the subdivision e-commerce and parcel, we're basically applying um, a territorial uh, view so that we basically say some, some of us are looking at Germany and Europe in, in more detail and uh, someone else is looking more into the international and the cross-border piece. So that's basically how it is explained that I basically look after everything regarded, uh, in regards to e-commerce outside of Europe and uh, my board colleague um, will basically look into Germany and, and Europe going forward. So um, the, the, the branding then basically changes uh, with regards to my, my role and the presence of, of my business in, in the regions, uh, which is called e-commerce, and that basically explains as to why uh, DHL e-commerce is, is the, the, the tagline and, and why I am the CEO for DHL e-commerce going forward. Now, I thought it would be interesting for you to, um, to, to take a, a quick look and, and basically take it as food for thought uh, on the profound changes of, of e-commerce. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I wanted to bring to you is, is about India. Um, as part of all the, the transition now, I've, I've been taking up responsibility for a company which is called Blue Dart. Yeah, and some of you probably know Blue Dart, uh, um, a, a very well-established market leader uh, in the Indian domestic express market. And uh, I'll leave you with the uh, details on, on the facts and figures. Um, very established market leader, uh, very nice market share. And um, what we see is that obviously this creates a very good foundation to strengthen our proposition on e-commerce in the Indian market. And I will explain to you more as to, as to how we see the Indian market unfold in a second. So um, you can basically tell um, this is a significant uh, uh, step forward in strengthening uh, the e-commerce proposition uh, outside Europe on, on that part. Um, of the world, and uh, we continue to build that going forward. Um, if you look at our e-commerce story, then I would like you to just relax and take a view at this little video 
as to how profound of a change e-commerce will be for us as an industry, but also for us as a consumer going forward. So please enjoy. So, so this is just a, a small glimpse, but basically what it tells us is, if you speak about e-commerce, I mean, it is all about the consumer, right? And, and you are all consumers in this room, and you all do the online shopping, right? And, and, and the profound change is that, obviously, you are in control, I mean, about the key elements of e-commerce uh, today and going forward with regards to what you buy in terms of selection of goods and selection of places as to where you want to buy with regards to the ordering process, and uh, I, I, I could imagine, I mean, all of you have mobile devices, I mean, you're not only from your, from your laptop PC or from your desktop PC, uh, payment methods, very important. I mean, you have a lot of variety today, and then delivery is a key part of that experience as well as to when to deliver, where to deliver, and the options that you have. So I think we've been typically starting in, in many ways as postal operators, as logistics companies, being more shipper-centric. Yeah? The story about e-commerce is a lot about the consumer, so, so we better get prepared for that uh, to really understand the, the, the nature of, of that profound transformation. Um, another element, emerging markets, um, just a few figures, and, and, and again, I mean, this is probably the best from our analysis that we can get. The numbers are mind-boggling, to say the least, so this industry is, is booming, it's very dynamic. And it's very dynamic both in, in developed markets as much as it is uh, in, in emerging markets. And maybe the number sounds small when you speak about 1 billion, 2 billion, 4 billion. It's still very sizable. It offers very great opportunities. The growth rates are even higher. Um, and then if you take uh, a look at the share of online versus total retail, you just see e-commerce is still a very, very small child. Yeah? This is basically day one or week one of e-commerce. Yeah, shares of like 1%, 2%, 6% of all retail sales is nothing. Yeah? So this will definitely emerge, yeah? but the point is we have to work on facilitating uh, this opportunity just to be able to, to capture the benefits of it. Um, Cross-border, um, th there's many, many views as to why cross-border happens in terms of e-commerce trade. And um, this is just taking uh, uh, two key insights from, from a study that, that we came across recently. Uh, it, was, um, it was published by, by PayPal. And uh, basically it says cross-border e-commerce revenues are supposed to, to grow at a 24% at a growth rate. And that's much, much higher than what you see happening in domestic markets. And then typically one would, one would say, why, why would you shop cross-border? Yeah? And basically, there's two key reasons in the first place. The one is product availability. Uh, and my famous example is there, I mean, your, your new iPhone without a contract is, is probably available outside your home market first. And the second is, is price arbitrage. 
Yeah, and there's clear evidence that those are still two driving factors. But what PayPal also came up with, and that matches very much what we found, is you have uh, uh, more than those two drivers in, in the consumer segments that we see from the so-called fearless adventurers uh, to some of the deal hunters. Uh, so there's a, a much greater variety at the consumer side as to why these guys go and shop cross-border. So we better keep that in mind when we design our uh, services and solutions for them. Um, so if you take a look in, into emerging markets, um, and again, opportunities and challenges, uh, this is not to say uh, the one-size-fits-all approach will basically do, do, it, uh, do the trick in those markets. But um, just, uh, just a few highlights maybe. Um, how important are emerging markets? If you just take on the left-hand side the, the, the middle comment, a growing consumer base. The global middle class set to grow 2.6-fold by 2030, and 90% of that is coming from Asia PEC. Uh, so, I mean, that's just huge. It's unbelievable in terms of dimension. If you go on the right-hand side in terms of challenges, um, there's a number of them, and these, these are just a few. And um, it, it's, it's as much important that you say trust is a key factor. And, and you also saw it in the video. People are conscious of their personal data, about their privacy, about their consumer rights. Uh, and it also affects payment. But then also take delivery, take infrastructure. Yeah? I think many of the things that have happened so far are based on the, on the fact that obviously um, we developed some, some infrastructure that facilitated e-commerce in picking up even more speed than it has been in, um, in the early years. Yeah, so so we, we, we should be very clear as to these challenges when you deal with emerging markets and um, not roll out a, a one-size-fits-all into these markets. Um, I saw it since, uh, since we spoke about India, just a few facts. Uh, obviously, a huge market, uh, 1.3 billion people. Obviously, uh, very, very small internet penetration at, at roughly 13%. Uh, but interesting, al already a 13% smartphone penetration. Um, and obviously, that's, that's going to be very interesting going forward. Um, you see a, a few market facts on the right-hand side. Uh, I mean, besides uh, the, the gross development over the coming years, 1% um, overall share of e-commerce uh, with regards to, to, to retail sales, 17% in South Korea. So you see the bandwidth of how, how these economies are developing. Um, interesting also, 48% of online shoppers um, very often or continuously pay cash on delivery. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very much higher portion than what you typically find uh, globally. And then with regards to, to segments, I mean, you see fashion is, is very, very low in terms of market share. Uh, you see fashion being like almost 30% of all internet sales in Germany. So, so we are very clear on, on recognizing these differences. And uh, since we have the World Cup uh, in Brazil, I thought I'd bring you some, some facts and figures about Brazil as well. Um, interestingly enough, it is a big country but it's only in comparison to India 200 people, which is still almost uh, three times as much as in Germany. Uh, you see internet penetration uh, 50%, that's, that's quite big. You see smartphone penetration already at 26%, that's also pretty interesting. Yeah? You see a few, a few um, elements of opportunity. Brazilian shoppers, so, so, so the ones who really go online, they only place seven orders a year. That's a quarter of what people do in the UK. Yeah? Um, 40% is, is, again, consumer electronics. So you, you see it's 7% in the United States. So, so you also have to recognize as to what can you actually sell online when you go into these markets. So when you compare the two markets, I found interesting a few things. Share of mobile commerce in e-commerce sales is much higher despite lower penetration of mobile devices in India. Yeah, you remember the two figures, 12% mobile penetration, smartphone penetration in India, 26% uh, in Brazil. Cash on delivery in, um, in India, but local credit cards in, in Brazil. And local credit cards in Brazil means you have to charge in real. Yeah? You cannot use any of the other currencies. So, so quite interesting also in terms of delivery times. The ratio orders uh, uh, returns is low, is lower than in other markets that I'm aware of. But uh, it's actually interesting to just understand these, these realities. And um, maybe just a little bit of advertising at this stage. We've been summarizing uh, some of these, um, these findings in a, in a study that I had commissioned uh, uh, some time back and which we've recently published um, in the course of our uh, strategy rollout. And it speaks about e-tailing, so the, the, the fusion between the physical and the online uh, uh, retail sector, 
uh, going forward into 2025. Uh, why did we pick 2025? Because we think it's, um, it's long enough to understand trends and, and developments that go beyond our conventional wisdom and understanding. And at the same time, it's, it's, it's still in reach. So I, I, I think I st I'm still working in, in 2025. So probably a good moment then to go back and uh, review some of the ideas that we have found in, in this study. Um, so, so as a conclusion, um, what we do see on a global scale is we will have a global, globally growing middle class and obviously the, the penetration of, of internet and mobile will continue uh, to happen and that basically will unlock uh, some of the distance selling potential that we see, especially in emerging markets. Um, we basically recognize some profound changes in how people buy online and it's actually one of our ambitions to really understand as to what that means for them in terms of buying domestically but also abroad. And then obviously um, there is an implication for logistics companies. We have to understand them to really provide uh, flexible payment, pickup and return solutions, as well as reliable and trustworthy delivery. Um, these are my two cents. Happy to answer questions uh, later on and throughout the conference. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>